This morning I titled our message, This is Your Life. This is your life, and specifically in context, our lives in Christ, right? Um, I don't know if you guys would remember an old TV show. It was actually, if you can believe it, before my time. But yes, there was a show that was called This Is Your Life. And what it was, was a, a host, the same host, I forget who he was, would bring this book and it would be this individual they would have sit down with them and they'd unfold this book and there would be people from their past and present that would just uh, give testimony about them and their lives. And you can look at it online and such not and see episodes, but it's a, it's a great testimony of what has happened in their lives and what's going on now in their lives. And that's why I titled this message, This Is Your Life, because the Apostle Paul begins now teaching us in Romans chapter 6 about the fact that we are dead to sin and we're alive in Christ. I think that's a great message. We're dead to sin and alive to Christ in our relationship. And, and so many folks I know um, um, struggle with this area of sin in their lives. And they struggle with recurring sin or they struggle with trying to find victory over some kind of sin in their life. And... Um, that just seems to be what I call a life-dominating sin. Something that's just dominating their lives. And they get so bummed out about it. They get so down about it. They get so dejected about it. And they feel rejected by others and even by Christ. But that is so not the case. But I want to encourage you this morning. This is where we're headed. I want to encourage you this morning that you are, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've given your life to Jesus. You said, God, I want you in my life. I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. And you say, Lord, I want you. I want a better life. I want the benefits and the blessings of a newness of life. If you've done that, then um, you know what? You are dead to sin and you're alive to Christ. Amen? I mean, that's the story. That's the gospel. You know, the Apostle Paul says, said in our studies thus far that man is not made right before God through his own deeds or keeping of the law. That's not how man is made right or made righteous but it's simply by faith and faith alone. That's it. I know that's a hard thing to grasp for some of us. You mean it's that simple? It's that easy? Well, in a word, yes, but in application, it can be very difficult, very hard. Just to accept something by faith. Well, our salvation, the Bible tells us, is not a matter of something that we've earned. It's not a working type of relationship. We don't work in our relationship with Jesus. He's paid the price and it is all by grace through the power and to the glory of God. It's, not, it, 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 it's, it's what I call a grace type of thing. It's all grace. And that's why when we talk about that this morning in the deadness of sin, because of the grace, because of the power of God, it's important, and I pray that I'm able to convey it such to where it's not a theology lesson this morning as a professor in a classroom, but yet it's something that is applicational for you, you can take home with you. And you can kind of work with it, and you can mold it, and you can like let it ruminate in your heart and your mind, and kind of like a cow chews the cud, right? That's why they got two stomachs, man. I mean, they eat something, goes in one, comes back up, they chew it, then it finally goes in the other stomach. They're chewing on it. They're they're, they're trying to break it down. So this morning, even if you need to break some of these things down as you leave this place this morning, uh, uh, definitely that would be something that the Lord would want you to do. Um, it's a grace thing, like I said. It's a grace thing. It's, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's free. It's totally free. It's undeserved. It's a free, undeserved gift of God to you and to me. And all we do, get this, all we do is trust and receive it. That's it. It's real simple. Yet, like I said, applicationally, it can be very difficult. The Bible shows us that sin was present, as we've been studying, in the world even before the law of Moses was given. Way before Moses, sin was already present in the world. But when the law was given, okay, when the Ten Commandments were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, the, the, the law then became like a shining spotlight, a huge spotlight. And it illuminated then the idea of sin. A, a quick sharing on my life. 
You know, before I became saved, as many of you know my testimony, you know, there was no temptation to me. It was like everything under the sun. There was no right nor wrong, just what I wanted to do. And if it felt good, then I would do it. If it seemed right to me, I would go with it. But when I became saved, then I realized what the word temptation was all about. Maybe some of you have experienced the same thing. Then I understood because the standard then or now is not my own list of standards, my own plumb line, but the plumb line of God and the standard of God. And, and I have to say, Lord, what gives you good pleasure? Lord, Lord, what pleases you? It pleases you that I stop doing this thing or pleases you that I think this way or I think that way. It's unpleasing to you, God, if I do certain things in my life. And now the standard is way different because it's no longer me. So many of us say that we have a relationship with God, yet we still haven't fully surrendered the old man as Paul is going to teach us this morning. A full surrendering to God and saying, God, whatever it is you want, God, whatever it is you want to do, I am willing there's so many of us to say we're believers, yet we haven't yet still submitted or surrendered our lives to Christ. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning to be able to do that later on today. That if the Spirit of God goes upon your heart and you say, man, I need to rededicate my life. Or man, I need to give my life to Christ because I really haven't experienced His power. I don't even know what you're talking about, Tom. Then it's like, amen. That God has brought you here for a specific reason. But when the law was given, that shining spotlight came upon sin, making sin way more obvious in my life and I'm sure in your lives as well, ceasing, or causing then sin to abound. It's like, oh man, there's so much. And that's what happened to me when I became saved. When I, when I became a follower of Jesus Christ, I realized, man, there's so much sin in my life. And you know what? None of us are perfect. We still stumble. We still struggle. We're still trying to overcome things in our lives. We're trying to do that. And Paul is going to speak to us in the latter portions about sanctification, our walk in Christ. That right now, in the sense that we have to understand that sin itself didn't increase in the giving of the law. But the understanding of sin increased. And that's what happened to my life. I understood then that is sin. And that, you don't like that, God. And if I, if I continue in that path of sin, it only leads to destruction and to death, the Bible does tell me. But if I choose to walk this path, Lord, your path, let your word be a lamp unto my feet, let it guide my way, then in that case, God, I know that my life will be different. It will be so much more genuine. It will be real. And, and I'll have the Holy Spirit now to guide me and to lead me into the good pleasure, the desire, the will of God. That's the idea. That's what being a Christian is all about. That, that's, the, that's the essence of what a Christian is, is one who's following God with passion and one who loves God with all their heart, all their soul, their mind, their strength, and they're loving Jesus Christ in all that they do. There's not loving God halfway in a Christian relationship, in a fellowship with God. It's not loving Him halfway, but it's loving Him all the way and allowing Him to do amazing things in our lives. Yet, you know, even in the giving of the law, when sin became obvious, grace also became more obvious. The grace of God. You see, as sin abounded, grace abounded even more. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that great? Man, thank you, God. But as deep as our sins are, every one of us has them, God's grace is always much more. It's always bigger. Think of your biggest sin in your life, past, present, or, ooh, God forbid, future. Think about it. God's grace pours over that. It's like water, hot water being poured over a, a, an ice cube. Man, it just melts it away. 
And that's the idea of God's grace. Chapter 1 through 5, we've studied already. And if you're new this morning or visiting us, chapter 1 through 5 in Romans talks to us about justification. Paul was all over the pages with justification. Just as if I've never sinned, you could say. But it's now beginning positionally, a position we have with Christ of righteousness. It's our rightness now before God. God, you have come into my life. God, you have saved me. I have accepted you as my Lord and Savior. Now I am made right before you. And it is your righteousness you've given to me. And that word that they use in the Bible is one of of an accounting term. It's like a deposit, an account giving. It's an imputed righteousness. It's God on the cross said, you know what, Tom, you're such a sinner that I want to trade something for you, with you. I want to trade you your sin for my righteousness. That's the idea of the cross. You see, Christ on the cross gave us His righteousness. And so He withdrew my sin and He deposited His righteousness. And thereby He took on my sin. The Lamb of God, right? Who takes on the what? Sin of the world. See, that's that's the great exchange that God did for each and every one of us who have a relationship with Him. So positionally, in our position with Christ, where we're at with Him, with the Lord, speaks totally about truth, about our relationship in God, before Him. Now in chapters 6 through 8, Paul is going to switch gears a little bit. Paul's going to speak to us about this word called sanctification. All sanctification means it's a practical place we have before the Lord in our walks with Him. If you're saved this morning, then you are walking with God. In the sense you are living a life in Christ. Some of us closer than others, but nonetheless we are walking with the Lord. That's sanctification. It's not perfection. The Lord knows I'm not perfect And Lord knows you're not perfect. I can say that confidently because the Bible says so. That every one of us. And in in that, it's not about perfection. It's not sinless perfection that the Bible teaches. And in our walks with God, we know now about what what the truth is. Paul's going to lay out the truth for us and how our walks are to look like with God. How they're to be with the Lord. So let's start in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Romans. It says, what shall, I, shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It's interesting how Paul starts this. He starts it with a question, I think. And I know, and I'm wondering, well, Lord, why, you know, why would Paul start with this question? But it seems to be one of the things that Paul could have or might have possibly have been accused of teaching. That, that, okay, because God's grace is so available and abundant and so amazingly all the time, so does that mean I just sin? So that means I'm just going to sin because, hey, God's grace is going to be there waiting for me. Well, the answer is no. Verse 2, Paul says, certainly not. Like, God forbid you would even think that. That's not the case at all. So Paul doesn't want to be misunderstood here. So he's now making sure that we understand his heart and we understand what the Spirit is speaking through him. When people misunderstand his teachings, these are the teachings of what he's speaking of. Chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. You can look at it in your Bibles. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound... But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Agreed. I'm with you, Paul. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So so then he says, well, what are we going to say? What am I going to say then? Do, Do we sin more so that grace can just abound more? You see, people might think that they come to a conclusion that sin abounding was a good thing. It was a good thing to sin because guess what? Now we get to enjoy the abounding grace of God. Wouldn't it make sense then if we had that thought process in our minds that just to sin in a sense, we would want to do a whole lot of it just so that we can experience God's grace? 
Well, folks in, in this who, who think that way or believe that way, they don't really understand what the grace of God is really all about. I desire today that you, you really understand and apprehend the grace of God. That it is something you don't have to work at because it's a free gift. It's been given to you because He loves you. He, he just plain loves you. And He's given you this amazing grace to, to, to enjoy your relationship with Him. Folks like this who misinterpret the teaching of Paul, they haven't learned that grace truly changes things and should make a change in our lives. The response to God's grace is that I want to please Him. You know, has anybody ever been just really good to you? I mean, just swell to you. Just like, man, they just blessed you. Well, what's your, what's your response then to that? Don't you like want to, man, what can I do for you? How can, I, how can I bless you back doubly in return? I mean, you see, that's the idea of God's grace. Our response to His grace is that we just want to bless Him more, bless others more, love others, serve Him. All of those things. Grace changes things. It truly does. They haven't realized why grace makes all things different in our lives because of His grace. I think it's sometimes a scary thing to trust in God's grace because we're so not there in grace. We live in a world and a society to where it is earnings. It is working. It is what have you done for me lately? Have you checked the box? Have you done those kinds of things to prove yourself to earn your good graces with me? I mean, that's society. That's the world. And many of us deal with that in our jobs. They're called annual reviews, right? True. Because you're working towards that increase in your salary. So you're doing everything you can to be in the good graces of your boss so that they can give you that highest increase possible. Well, in God's economy, it doesn't work that way. God is like, hey, I've already paid it for you. God is saying, all you got to do is trust me, believe in me, and accept me. And I'll do the rest in your life. You see, we don't have to work at it by God speaking to my heart. When I became a Savior, or when I became saved, the Savior showed me, these are things that I need to change. These are things that are not beneficial in my life. These are things that I must grow in, that I must progress in. I must get stronger in. I must mature in. See, it was the Holy Spirit doing that. Paul's thought now in verse 2, he says, Certainly not, or God forbid, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So Paul's thought is here is if we've died to sin at one point in the past, because it's past tense, if we've died to sin, how are we going to live in the future in sin? How is that possible? Well, the theme in the next verses here as we read this this morning is what it means to be dead to sin. What it really means to be dead to sin. Paul's going to make it a point that we are dead to sin and that the person who has truly been born again shouldn't be making their sin a constant practice or a constant way of life. That's why he's saying, do, so that means I just sin? Because I'm just going to want, because I want to experience the grace of God continually in the pattern and pattern of sin. Well, Paul is saying, no, <laughs> sorry, that's not how it works. And that's not what the Holy Spirit is, is speaking to us this morning about. Verse 3 says, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, we're baptized into his death. So Paul is now bringing up an example of baptism. He says, do you not know? In the beginning. That phraseology in the, in the language means to be ignorant or just plainly not to know. You're not unaware of it. Not to understand. And it's written in what's called the present tense. Meaning it's in the now. So Paul, as he's writing this, He's writing to these believers now, as he's speaking to us this morning, now. He says, so now, you understand justification, you're saved, you're walking with Christ, okay, but 
Do you understand? Do you understand that you were also baptized into death as was our Savior? You know, I, I believe the implication uh, is that this truth, I think, also, I think it needs to be taught and I think it needs to be understood, the baptism of, of, of death with Christ. Because this isn't something that just magically happens when we become a Christian, when we become saved. That, that, that all of a sudden we wake up one day uh, with absolutely no thought of sin. I mean, I could probably say that every one of us this morning had some kind of thought that wasn't edifying. Some kind of action that wasn't pleasing to God. Some action of sin. There's going to be truth here that we'll need to develop in our lives. That's, that's the message. It's an ongoing process, in other words. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a lifestyle that also needs to be practiced. We have to practice it. It's like sports or anything else. We've got to practice it. If you're not practicing the things of God in your relationship with Him, then, then you're never going to progress. You're never going to go forward. You're never going to go from the minors into the majors, so to speak. You're going to always stay in the one area because you're not progressing. You're not practicing a lifestyle or practicing things to be developed in our lives, to mature us. He uses the word baptize. That means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, or to cleanse by dipping or submerging, or to overwhelm. I think about that, to overwhelm. When we jump into a swimming pool or we're at the beach, man, the water overwhelms us, doesn't it? It covers us. We're immersed in it. That's the idea that Paul is speaking about here. But a question comes up. Is Paul talking about water baptism, or is he talking about some kind of spiritual kind of baptism into Jesus? Well, the answer, I believe, is yes to both. I believe he's speaking to us about the water baptism, but also, in the sense, a spiritual baptism as we become saved. I believe Paul talks about what happens when we become born again, right? You guys are familiar with that term, I pray? Born again. If you're not, it's an old term, but it's a true term, and it's actually from the Bible, where Jesus speaks to Nicodemus and says, one must be born again. It's a word that we use as Christians to signify the fact that we are in a newness of life, that we are different, we've changed. No longer are we remaining the same, doing the same old stuff. But there's been a progression in our walk with the Lord, a maturing in our walk with Jesus. And that's what being born again is. You're accepting Him now as your Savior and your Lord. God, I want you in my life. God, I need you in my life, and I need you to, to bring me into a newness of life, Lord. That, that's the whole idea of being born again, and then we are being transformed more into His likeness. I believe Paul is also talking about the union we have with Jesus. And the picture that, we can, that he draws for us is of what one we see in the area of baptism. Water baptism is a picture of the process of that work. As we're put into the water, we're identifying ourselves with the death of Jesus Christ. It's an identification. We, can't be, we can be baptized in water and still not be saved. And vice versa. But I pray that if you've accepted Jesus into your life, that you have been baptized, it's great. Remember, baptism doesn't save us. It doesn't save us at all. That's, that's not a, a right teaching. But baptism is just an outward expression of what God's doing on the inside of your life. And personally, myself, I was baptized. My wife and I were baptized when we became saved. I was baptized again in the Jordan twice. It's because God's just doing neat things in my life, and I just want to declare and proclaim what God's been doing. And that's the cool thing about it. And so, yes, I've been saved, and God is in my life, but yet God is continually doing different things in my life, and I pray He is in yours. Verse 4, we go on, and it says, Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, 
that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. This is where Paul begins to speak to us about the walk we have in Christ. Sanctification. To give you an idea and understanding, all sanctification does mean is once we're justified, as Paul has been teaching us, once we're saved, we're made positionally righteous with God, well, now we begin a walk in Christ. Sanctified means we're set apart because if you've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, now you've been kind of plucked out of the world and you put here now for the Master's use. And now He wants to use you. He wants to teach you. He wants to love on you. He wants to show you amazing things. But He separated you now from the world. That's really what sanctified means. Set apart. And you're set apart now for His use, not for any other use. Yes, you still work your job. Yes, you still go shopping at Walmart. Yeah, you still go to Starbucks. Yeah, you still go to the beach. Yeah, you still do those things. But now there's a different purpose in mind, guys. That's the whole idea. It's a different purpose. Paul's going to speak to us about the purpose. And so in that, our purpose, our perception is fully different. Paul starts off by saying we were buried with Him. Buried together with who? Uh, well, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. It's like, what? Really? Yeah, what's been happened, what happened here is that through baptism, the significance of that, instead of one casket being lowered into the ground, there are now two caskets being lowered into the ground. Yours and the Lord's. Not only was Jesus buried, but we were buried as well. And there's something about this, that as Christ died and was buried, there's a kind of, in my life at least, a reality that says, man, Lord, I've been really buried with you. I, I, I have been. Because you tell me I was dead in my trespasses. You tell me that I was dead to sin and now I'm alive to you. So that means that there had to be a time in my life that I was, in fact, buried spiritually. And there comes that realization, that understanding. See, the act of baptism in and of itself is a way of identifying with the burial of Jesus Christ. As we're put under the water, we're being, for, we're being buried as well. He says through the baptism into death. Well, this is how we're buried with Christ. Baptism connects you and me with the death of Jesus Christ. And we're buried with Him. Then he says, by the glory of the Father, which means that by the way in which Jesus was raised from the dead. It could be translated, it's a preposition by, the other preposition could be through, coming through. So he says, through the glory of the Father, he had been raised. So the glory and the power of the Father was involved in raising Jesus from the dead. That's what Paul is saying to us. But there's a question then. Is there a connection? Is there really a connection between our walking victoriously then if we struggle with something? If there's something in our life that seems to be life dominating or all those little pesky little things that seem tempting us and we fall into that temptation. We fall in because our flesh is just weak. And we succumb to those things. Is there a connection with walking in Christ walking victoriously and the glory or the power of God resonating in our lives? Well, yeah, there is. There's a great connection in that. Because Paul, in that same verse, uses the two words, just as. So there's a, there's a similarity, there's a likeness. Just as. In other words, the same thing that was involved in raising Jesus from the dead should be involved in us walking in newness of life. Amazing. There's a lesson for us, I think, in that, and one is God's glory is our strength. You know, and a lot of times I think, man, Lord, if I could be more about your glory instead of my own glory, if I could be more about you, Lord, instead of about me, if I could think more of your desires for my life instead of my desires for my life, I think I could and maybe you could also see a lot more victory in your life over these things. It's too easy, I think, a lot of times, 
for us to make us the reason we do anything. I mean, look at social media, right? I mean, I, I, I love social media. I'm all connected into it. But I think so many times, I mean, I look at people's lives, my friends, right? My friends. And I look at their lives, and man, I wonder, did they ever have a bad day? I mean, show me a selfie of where they're having a bummed out day. Seriously. I mean, it gets me depressed looking at their happiness. And I wonder, man, Lord, I must be kind of messed up. Because my day isn't always that happy and cheery. And, you know, Mr. Bluebird isn't always shine, singing on my shoulder. He's not there. And I'm like, Lord, is there something wrong with me? Many times we have to be talked into why it's a good reason even in order to do something for the Lord. We have to be coerced, in other words. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and do what? And glorify your Father in heaven. There's a purpose, guys. There's a purpose. There's a reason. How often I think of myself, am I doing good works really for the sole purpose of giving glory to God? Is that my... Response, is that my motive? He then talks about the word newness. He says, a newness of life in verse 4. See, this is the blessings. The blessings is that because we were buried with him through baptism and death, and just as he was raised by the power of God, we are also raised by the power of God. Even so, we would also walk in the newness of life. That's the blessing. That's the wonderful, wonderful blessing that you and I receive, being dead to sin and alive to Christ. This word newness in this word here used in this context seems to be a lot stronger than just saying, oh, you've been given a new life. It's so different, the two words. A new life versus newness of life. You stay with me on this. You know, when I think of a new life, I think of those ads that say, new and improved, right? Here's the new and improved product. Well, the product, uh, I don't know what they did with it except slap a new uh, sign on it that says it's new and improved. It works the same, and I wonder, what do I do with the old one in my cupboard now? Is I, do I throw it away? Is it not good enough? But, but the difference in new and improved reminds me of, the, um, of that other word that is opposite of newness, a, a new life. It's just so opposite of newness. Newness really means to us, hey, we're a new creation. Right? Doesn't the Bible declare that? That we're new creations in Christ. That whole word reminds me of the word metamorphosis. It reminds me of a, a, a growing, a, a just transforming, that we will not look anything like we did before. But, but that we're different. And there's a newness in our lives, a freshness in our lives, a spring to our step, you might say, the joy and the hope of Christ in us. Then he says, we should walk this way. That word means to tread or to walk around, to make one's way, but I like the other definition. It says progress. I mean, think about our progress, if you will. Are we progressing in the Lord? Are we moving forward in things of Christ? Or are we still in the same place we're at? Think about that in your own life. Take stock, take inventory, as I do many times in my life. I have to always constantly say, Lord, you know, I want to be moving forward in you. I don't want to be in the same place I was two years ago. Saying the same thing, playing the same song. You know, it's like those, those groups. You know, 70s groups don't die. Right? They just come back and have a reunion tour, right? Isn't that the truth? Singing the same old songs, and they look really bad. <laughs> really bad. And so it's like, oh my goodness. Get a new repertoire of songs going, you know? I don't want to be like those groups of the 70s and be singing the same songs and looking the same way. I want to be different, don't you? 
Don't you want to be different than you were in the beginning of your salvation? It's called progress. God is maturing us from here to here and from here to here. And that's okay if they're little steps. That's okay. But as long as we're moving forward in the things of God, isn't that the thing that matters the most? We learn little lessons. We learn big lessons. Medium-sized lessons. That's okay. But in, in that, we're growing. We're progressing. So that's how Paul says we should walk. A person who is alive is a person who actually walks around. I don't know, I'm not into them, but there's a lot of folks that are into those zombie movies, right? Man, Walking Dead, Night of the Living Dead, all of these movies. Well, listen, zombies don't walk around, they're dead. There's no, okay, there's no such thing as zombies, okay? First off, there's no such thing. But what I'm saying is, is that dead is dead. And that's it. Only one person came to life, and his name was Jesus. He was the only one that was ever resurrected from the dead, and his name is Jesus Christ. So in this, a, a dead person just lies there doing nothing. A person who's been raised from the dead is one who gets up and walks around, right? They get up and they walk around. When we're walking around, we're to be walking around, Paul says, in the newness of life. We who were once dead in our trespasses have been made alive in Christ. What a great, great thing we have for us. A completely new life. We are a new creation in Christ, truly. Verse 5 goes on to say, For we have been united together in the likeness of His death. Certainly also shall be, we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. We have been, he says, that means to become or to begin to be something that's done in the past, but also because it's been done in the past, it has an effect into the present. Something that, you ever think about something in your life that's rocked your world. Something that's rocked your world. Well, guess what? It has, it's happened then and it has an effect on your life in the present and in the future, does it not? Something major that's happened. It affects us. And that's what Paul is saying here. The point is, is that we've been united with Jesus in his death. And if we've been united with Jesus in his death, Paul says, guess what? We will be united with Jesus in his resurrection. That's the idea. You don't, you, and you can't have one without the other. We want, we should want and desire to experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in our lives. We should. But first we have to grab hold and understand what does it mean to be united with Christ in his death? To be one with Christ in his death. Verse 6, he continues on, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be made done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. The word knowing that he uses here is a Greek word, which means to learn or to know or to come to know, but it's actually a knowledge that's grounded on personal experience. So this word used in this context, knowing, means Paul is saying you've already experienced this. It's already done. And in experience it and knowing it, now you should get it because he's saying it in the present tense. Now you should know because of that experience that rocked your world when you got saved. He also uses the word old, which means old, it means ancient, it also means no longer new. It means the worse for wear. You know, I, I wear these jeans and you were to look at them and say, wow, Tom, how long have you owned them, man? They're all kind of tattered looking and they uh, throw them away. Well, you know, you buy them this way these days, right? You buy them this way, and that's how they look. They look worse for wear. They look worn and torn. But that's kind of the style these days. And they're more comfortable nonetheless. But, but what we're talking about, and Paul's talking about, this is a reference into our sin nature. Man, our sin nature. It's commonly called our flesh, right? Don't we say that? If, if you're new to Christianity or if you don't know Christ, uh, we Christians talk a lot about the flesh because it's weak. Man, we, we get overcome by it. And the flesh oh, gets overcome by temptation. Oh my goodness, the spirit is, is strong but, and willing, but the, the flesh is weak. Man, I want to do well, but yet I get 
overtaken by this temptation. My flesh draws me there. My, my sin nature draws me there. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the flesh. And that's just a part of us. Man, it's a part of us that's inside of us that just calls out to rebel and sin against God. That's what it's about. Our sin nature is called old because it's wise <laughs> and it's mature. It has our, our sin nature, our, our flesh has a lot of wisdom and it's very mature because it's been in our lives a while possibly. I know it was for me. I didn't come, come saved until I was 33 years of age. So sin had been available and rampant in my life up to that time. And in, in that, it, it, was, it was so wise. It is still wise because in this, we're going to talk about a word that is called paralyzed. And even though sin might be paralyzed in your life, it still has like a talking head. And it still wants to lie to you. Well, in this, our sin nature is called old because it's also worn out and it's ready to die. Man, give it up. Crucified with means to be crucified with something. It's used in the Gospels, actually, to describe the two thieves, even, that died on the cross with Jesus, Matthew 27, 44. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Paul uses it here, and he also uses it in Galatians 2, 20. And he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, so I think that when we think about Jesus hanging on the cross between the two thieves, somehow we need to understand and learn that we're up there with him too. We're no different than the two thieves up on the cross. We're the same. The lesson here, I believe, is to learn death. Learn, learn. We, we need to learn about this death. We need to know this. Our knowledge, that isn't merely a head knowledge. It's not what we know, but it's a knowledge that we have by experience. The gnosko, the, that knowing, as Paul says in the verse. And he says it might be done away with. Well, the word might kind of gets at me sometimes. It means to render idle. It means to be unemployed, inoperative, or caused to cease, or in some cases also paralyzed. The word talks about a possibility, a potentiality, or something that may or may not happen. It may or may not occur. In other words, it's possible then, Paul's saying, that our sin nature can actually become inactive. I think about it now, I think it's dormant, right? Because too many times uh, we want to uh, bring it back to life. The old King James Version uses, in place of this word, uses destroyed instead of done away with. I think some of us might think that if it's destroyed, it's done, that guess what? It more than likely will not return back. But I think we're really surprised when it does, right? How many of us have been in a situation to where we have really believed that there's been victory over a certain sin in our life and yet it's come back to rear its ugly head? And then we're all surprised. Whoa, how did that happen? How, why did it come back? See, it's not the sin nature that's totally obliterated. The sin nature is still there in all of us. But on the cross, it was rendered inoperable. It was rendered paralyzed. Or it might be. When Christ died on the cross, he disabled it, our sin nature. But it has the potential, like I said, of coming back. And the problem is, is that we reactivate it. He says that we should. This is what I was talking about earlier in that verse 6. He says that we should no longer be slaves to sin. The idea here is a purpose. Paul says all of this to say this, that we should. It's a purpose type of clause. Understanding our old nature was crucified with Christ has a purpose in our lives. It should mean something to us, in other words. It's a reason that Christ died for us and we asked him into our lives, right? There's a reason for that. And I think the reason is that the purpose should be that then we live for Him. That, 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 that we go full out for Christ. We shouldn't be enslaved to sin. He uses the word, no longer be slaves to sin. That means to obey or submit or surrender yourself to that thing. 
What determines whether I'm a slave to sin? Well, Romans 6.16, we get into it later on. It says, do you not know to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slaves and whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. So either way, we're going to be a slave to something, either to righteousness, to God, or to sin, to the devil, to the world. All of those things. The issue is, I think, comes down to all of us is we have a choice. This is your life, right? This is your life. The issue is, is who am I obeying? Who am I obeying truly? Am I, obey, am I obeying sin or am I obeying God? Because before Jesus came into my life or came into your lives, we were obedient slaves to sin. You know what? In a slave-master relationship, the surest way to be set free is to die. In a slave-master relationship, the only way of escape is death. Because we can try and run away from the master of sin in our lives. But you know what's going to happen? You might be caught and be sent right back. That's what happens when we try and run away from sin instead of kill it. Strike it dead. Do whatever you can do to eliminate it so it will not grab you back again. And when you're dead, that master no longer holds anything over you, right? There's nothing that the master of sin holds over you because you've reckoned it dead and before the cross. Our final verse this morning, verse 7, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Whoa, hallelujah, huh? Glory to that. Wow. We are freed from sin, but we have to die first. You know, I look at seeds and I look at plants and it's like, man, in and of itself, it just seems like something dead. But yet it produces life. Has been freed means to render righteous or such we ought to be rendered righteous. This is the word that Paul has been using from chapters 1 through 5. The word is found actually 40 times in the New Testament. But on all but two times, it's translated justified. But this is the only place it's translated freed. The only place it tells us translated freed. One commentator says, As a man that is dead is acquitted and released from bondage among men, so a man that has died to sin is acquitted from the guilt of sin and released from his bondage. Give you an illustration. Uh, famous commentator Dwight L. Moody told of a young man who, who did not, told, uh, was told of a young man who did not want to serve in Napoleon Bonaparte's army. So when he was drafted, this young man, a friend volunteered to go into his place. I'll, I'll go for you into battle. The substitution was made, and sometime later, the surrogate, that one young man, was killed in battle. Well, with that same young man, there was some kind of a clerical error that happened, and he was called back up, recruited back up in Napoleon's army. But he's like crying out, wait a minute, I'm dead already. I'm dead. I, 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 I died on the battlefield. Well, they argued, and they checked out things, and finally, the case was, was actually... Uh, uh, reviewed and after one side they thought no 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 you haven't no your name's not then they found his name and a man's name next to it and they verified surely and it went all the way up to the emperor himself and after he examined the evidence this is what Napoleon said through a surrogate this man was not only has not only fought but he has died in his country's service no man can die more than once Therefore, the law has no claim on him. You and I have died only once to sin. And that's what Paul is talking about here. The lesson is we are dead to sin. Thinking about how important it is to die to sin. And there's some practical things that we need to be doing in our lives. One is we need to starve it. What I mean by that is as Galatians 6 says, don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will always reap what you sow. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful desires will harvest the consequences of decay and death. 
but those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. That's Galatians 6, 7 and 8 in the New Living Translation. So you got a choice. You can either feed the flesh or you can starve it to death. That's the only two choices you have. Or you can choose to feed the flesh or choose to feed the Spirit. The next is just say no. Because death and crucifixion, just say no, kill it, render it dead, those things, death and crucifixion though, in a general sense, are kind of unpleasant. But one of the most unpleasant things that I can do, because many times we just like it, is reckon or crucify our sin to death. Let me share with you a final illustration as we close this morning. Uh, coming from Los Angeles, um, I'm a Laker fan, and I remember the days growing up of, of um, A.C. Green and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and those guys. And they did a, a, an article on him, and this I didn't know about A.C. Green. Here it is. Ten years ago, A.C. Green of the Dallas Mavericks set a remarkable record playing in his 907th consecutive game, an NBA record. A.C. was profound of that mark, but he was even prouder of this. He was almost 35 years old and still a virgin. In the fast and loose world of the NBA, where gorgeous young women are a constant temptation, that's a remarkable record. A.C. Green wrote an article in Ebony Magazine back in 98. That's 1998, right? An attractive black woman recently asked me about my sex life. AC, she said, why are you a virgin at 34? You're a handsome man, you're an athlete, and I know women are all over you all the time. Why are you still a virgin? Well, he said, it is not the first time I've been asked the question. It came up in high school. It came up where I attended Oregon State. But in recent years, the question has taken on more significance. In today's society in which sex is portrayed as the alpha and omega, the way and means for all and everything, the fact that I'm a virgin seems to present a perplexing oddity. But being different, being unusual, being odd is not a problem for me. I am who I am and what I am, and I'm quite comfortable with that. I am a virgin because, first of all, that's what God has designated for me at this time. Being a single man, I have committed my life to let him make the decisions, not me. I am following his rules, so that the first thing. Secondly, I choose to be abstinent because of the self-respect and high regard I have for my body. It's a choice I'm proud of, he says. There are tests, there are trials, but to me it is not as hard as most people would imagine. You only really get tested when you put yourself in a tempestuous situation or spend your time around tempting women. Many, you'll find out exactly what you're made of, but I wouldn't trust myself to a stupid test like that. Therefore, it's best for me to keep away from the possibility of compromising situations. Man, don't we need like heroes like this? I looked recently upon him and he's got his own ministry going and he's continuing to serve Jesus Christ there in Los Angeles and it's like man God thank you so much that not only do we have Tim Tebow as a as a as a hero model to us in a sense one guy that we can at least look up to that doesn't compromise but this guy which I didn't know AC Green man virgin at 34 years of age following Jesus Christ and continuing in his retired years to be a witness for Christ isn't that the greatest of testimonies? I really think it is. And you know, the crucifix um, means, I'm going to ask Carrie to come up here real quick. And uh, The crucifix means taking the unpleasant road, guys. That's what it means. And the, the crucifix means taking another road uh, instead of the one that leads to temptation and destruction. For you young people here today, you know, the testimony is going to be not how you stumbled and fell and came back to the Lord, but the testimony is going to be how you stayed tight with Jesus Christ. That's the testimony, like A.C. Green. How you hung tight, how you were close to Jesus. You're following Jesus with everything. And you're not having a testimony that says, well, yeah, I followed him, but I, I just had to find myself and I had to go experiment. And, hey, talk to your parents. Hey, they'll tell you about the experiments. You don't need to experience it. 
But I really want to encourage you young people this morning, man, as I ministered to a lot of young people on the college and elsewhere, it's like, listen, you don't have to go through the experiences to know what it's about. Talk to folks like myself who have walked it and are very unbiased, but will tell you the truth because we love you and because we care about you and we want you to succeed and we want you to do well in Jesus. And we want you to have a testimony that is kept and protected and said, hey, you know what? Yeah, there were many temptations, but the Lord gave me wisdom to refrain from tempestuous situations and stay out of that. You know, Paul is saying here that our relationship with Jesus is one of victory and not one of defeat. Amen? And that's what it's about. That our walk in Christ is that of knowing that we are one with Christ. We're one with Christ and that our old ways and our old life and our old thoughts and our old habits, they've been nailed to the same cross that Christ is raised up on. And this is the kind of life that Jesus has for us today. It's a life built on hope and it's a life built on the security of our Savior, Jesus. The choice of walking with Jesus. And again, I speak to the young people here today. There's a choice you have to make in walking with Jesus, either walking with Him or walking in the ways of the world. There's no third choice. It's one or the other. It's a walk made up of daily decisions for you guys. Daily decisions and and daily choices. And you know what? It's not only you, but it's a process for every one of us. seems the older we are, the more decisions come our way to choose the right thing or not. There's so much more at stake. It's not only a daily choice, I believe, but it's a journey. A whole lifelong journey. And in this journey, God is going to mold us and He's going to develop us. And He's going to do these things continually into His righteousness. That's the idea. That's what Paul is setting up in chapter 6 today. And I pray that you guys are encouraged in this as I have been. And I just want to pray now as we just enter into this time. And you know what? I want to give you guys an opportunity. This is, this is, this is the opportunity, as I said in the beginning. That if anybody here has not been walking with Christ, you know what? It's no shame in that. There's no reason to be uh, 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 fearful. There's no reason for for you to say, oh man, what's my mom and dad going to think? What are my friends going to think? What are those in the church going to think? What are they going to think? It's like, who cares what they're going to think, really? But what the most important thing is you and God right now, right here. And knowing this, as the Apostle Paul says, knowing this, You have a choice to make. You have a decision to make this morning. Either to live for Christ or live for the world. Christ so loves you and Christ so died for you on the cross that he's made a way and he's taken your sin. He can take your sin from you. And if you've been walking with him but you've deviated and you're like, man, I know, I know, I know what I need to do. Then you need to do it today. Right now. Man, you'll just be blessed. It's like that new life. That, 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 that whole new um, newness of life that Paul speaks about. Man, everything's passed away. Every, everything's erased. It's okay. You just come to him and rededicate your life. And if you're here today and you don't know him, but you're like, man, Tom, I, I want that newness of life. I just want that in my life. Because my life right now is difficult, it's hard, and I need God. I need Him. And let's pray. Lord, I thank You for Your Word this morning. I pray, Lord, first for those who who don't know You here this morning, that they've never experienced the newness of life, God, and You're just waiting to give it to them. That, God, that all they would have to do is surrender their ways to You and surrender their life to You, Lord, and let You work everything else out following that they would know that they don't have to work or strive or maintain or earn their way, but it is a free gift given by you. And they're just saying, Lord, I, I just, I'm tired of this, and I know, I know, I know that you're speaking to me now, that I need to come to you. If that's you this morning, then just raise your hand. I'm going to look out and just see. If anybody I'd like to pray for, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know him, All right. How about you guys and gals who know the Lord but know that you got to get right back with Him? Maybe that's you here this morning. 
You need to get back to him. You say, I know what I must be doing for the Lord. I know that I need my life right back. I also want to walk in a newness of life, but this new time with God, this new relationship with Jesus is not made up of a bunch of rules or regulations, but it's made up of just a fellowship with my Savior. And I know that I've been walking, just drifting away. If that's you this morning, then again, with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, just raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you guys. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, for those of you who raised your hands, just go ahead and just repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you, God, that you'll receive me, Lord. I thank you, God, that you love me so much that your son died on the cross for me. Lord, I want to make a new commitment to you, Lord. I want to walk in a newness of life. I want to not live under condemnation, but under, the, under your grace. Lord, come into me afresh and anew right now, I pray. And Lord, take over my life yet again. Help me walk closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.